thumbs up if you can see EPHT grant program updates slides. Great. Okay. Um, again, thanks for being here. Um, if you missed this messaging earlier on, um, me going through this presentation will probably take about 30 ish minutes, and Nikki will also um, jump in at the end. And if you need to leave at any at any point, we'll be able to post this recording. Um, and a lot of this information is also found on the Episcopal Presbyterian Health Trust website. So no worries if um, something comes up for you. And you can also touch base with us um, following the presentation as well. So I'm going to um, jump in. Thanks again for being here. We really want to make sure as many um, folks in the community as possible are aware of the Episcopal, Episcopal Presbyterian Health Trust program and some of the changes that are about to come into effect this year. Um, so I'll just in case you're unfamiliar or you're getting a refresher today, um, this program um, has a specific uh, purpose and it's to provide health care and medical services to indigent people, primarily those who live in the city of St. Louis, Missouri, or in immediate adjacent areas. Um, for the rest of this presentation and on the website, um, we use really different language now to kind of talk about what this purpose means. And it's focused on um, providing healthcare and medical services for those who are experiencing barriers or are not getting the outcomes they deserve. So indigent is not a word that you'll see um, outside of quoting directly from the trust documents. Um, and the reason the St. Louis Community Foundation, um, myself and Nikki are here today is because this is part of our role um, with a number of family and private foundations. We um, kind of act as consultants or back office. And so one of the things we've done for the Episcopal Presbyterian Health Trust is work with that board of donors to go through some strategic planning. And this is the outcomes we're sharing with you today. So they have um, decided to adopt some changes to their funding priorities. And before I share about that, I just wanted you to get a quick snapshot of what that process has looked like for our team and the Episcopal Presbyterian Health Trustees. Um, I think my third day in the office, we had a really exciting meeting with them where they just really wanted to um, focus on how to have a greater impact in the community. Um, if you have been familiar with them, they have funded a really wide range of health issues and they just wanted to take some time um, to see how their kind of pot of funding could be the most um, impactful in our community. So um, we, our, our team took time to speak with several nonprofits and providers to learn more about community needs and what a kind of good fit could be for the Episcopal Presbyterian. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say EPHT from now on. A good fit for EPHT um, could be. And through a series of meetings with them and really committed committee um, of trustees, we were able to come up with something pretty exciting for 2023. And so we're here at that um, second to last bullet introducing um, these changes to nonprofits. And by the end of this month, um, kind of the new, the new process will be rolling out. And we talked to over 20 people from 10 organizations and health systems. Um, this is just a, a brief snapshot of who um, very generously contributed their experience and expertise um, to the committee. And it's sad to um, kind of boil that down to one slide because the conversations were so rich and um, just really incredibly insightful. Um, but a big kind of takeaway from speaking with the community was that accessibility of care should be holistic, not groundbreaking, but something we really want to um, see actually act um, operationalized for EPHT. Um, and this looks like considering accessibility at every point of the healthcare spectrum, um, really acknowledging that people are whole people. Um, very rarely is a health need um, in isolation to some other ways that would bring meaningful support to members of our community. And we talked a lot about trust and broken trust and how trauma um, impacts the kind of care people need for trauma itself or for many other health needs. And then looking at um, really what it means to help folks navigate a complex system and feel safe in that process. And so this, again, a very succinct version of a lot of um, powerful conversations has informed um, what EPHT's kind of central guiding light is moving forward into 2023. They want to provide healthcare benefits and services that people did not have previously, and also sustain critical services that without those safety nets, people would not have services. So it's kind of two sides of the same coin and really looking at um, 
the populations and communities that are experiencing barriers and disparities. Um, so you'll hear this phrase and see it on the website, they want to center access in their grant making by addressing barriers and providing person-centric medical services across that spectrum, so prevention to aftercare. And instead of having um, so many different health um, categories outlined, which you would have seen previously on the website, um, they have moved to four um, funding priorities, essentially three with kind of a special projects um, box so that they can continue to be responsive. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about the access to healthcare piece, um, but for now, um, all the slides um, kind of give you a bit more of a breakdown of what each of those um, priority areas looks like. So access to care, th these funded approaches um, include models of care that address barriers, um, that navigation piece, helping people really get through um, or to and through the healthcare system to meet their needs. Um, and then some special considerations around workforce and um, kind of innovative approaches to care. And again, I'm gonna go into a lot more detail on the access to care piece. Um, so moving on to the other priority areas, the mental and behavioral health, um, really um, EPHT has also always had a, a pretty longstanding commitment for mental health services. It's been um, heavily reflected in their funding. And so um, just moving forward, really looking at services um, for, for youth who have experienced a lot of trauma and reducing um, self-harm and suicidal ideation and also looking at the just um, substance use and overdose deaths in our community and how to reduce those. Um, and then chronic disease, again, these things are all outlined, but there's a broader range of things that could be considered moving forward and just making sure, again, that full spectrum is represented, including prevention and then aftercare. And there is um, potential for some nutrition programming. It just will not be um, the, main, the main piece of programming that's funded under that. Um, and we can talk through that more with questions later. And then again, the special projects is to allow the trustees to be responsive to unforeseen health crises um, or really exciting opportunities for collaborative projects. The special projects is looking a bit more regionally um, or just um, but recognizing the fact that we continue to be in a pandemic that um, has changed so many things. Um, they just wanna ensure that they can be a key partner to um, public health responses um, in the future. And so that's kind of an overview of what's underneath each of those um, boxes. But kind of the important thing, and this is why I'll dive into access to care so much, is that access to care is a standalone priority, but it's also um, a grant making lens for the trustees moving forward. And so the approaches that I will walk through that really um, are intended to help folks get the care they need, um, those strategies are something the trustees would be really excited to see in mental and behavioral health and in chronic disease, um, the, their other priority areas. So I will walk through access to care a bit more. Um, so taking the first one, which is care models that address barriers. Um, this is something we spent a lot of time talking with um, our community partners about. And so looking at healthcare delivery that leverages trusted spaces like a school, um, a faith community, um, or just another place people are already um, having built relationships, looking at hours of care outside the traditional office hours, um, and just any, anything else that is intentionally designed to reduce a barrier. Um, so these could be co-location of services, again, opportunity for a lot of collaborative um, grant requests. And then there would be some, some financial support for direct transportation as well. Um, the next one is that navigation piece. So this is a lot um, of just ex ex an expanded view of what a care team could really entail. So perhaps that includes community health workers, case manager, um, or just other, other folks who may have shared experience or would be a safe and trusted person um, to help patients get through um, or access and get through the care they need. Um, so all of these um, bullets and this exact language is also on the website. And if you wanna be able to refer to it later, so you know, it's kind of a lot right now. Um, and then the responsive workforce piece, um, this is uh, just an opportunity again to say, what does it take to make care teams really work? Um, and so an application could um, be, you could submit an application around the healthcare workforce um, if you're able to demonstrate the link of how um, training or other kinds of support for um, the workforce would lead to better access um, and quality services. 
So one example that's on this slide would be training and behavioral health for community health workers. Um, and again, something that came up for our community feedback was just, you know, really people wanting to have providers or a care team that looks like them um, so that their needs um, are really being heard in that process of getting care. And then um, the innovative programming is for, you know, if you have a program that you want to expand to a different community um, or make a change that increases accessibility, um, this is kind of that special bucket. Um, again, trustees really um, valuing that ability to be responsive as well. Um, and so another key piece that will look different in terms of priorities you'll see on the website and applied to um, application materials is there's a funding footprint that has shifted um, previously, um, folks could apply from, I think, a five-county area, and um, through the strategic planning process, we've moved to 25 zip codes, 22 in Missouri and 23 in Illinois. Um, if you're familiar with the Anchor Action Network, some of this will look really um, similar and familiar um, as part of EPHT trustees wanting to kind of link up their efforts with other regional investment strategies. Um, and so if you are, you know, not quite sure how your organization fits um, within this. All of the questions that um, are part of applying in this process, which I'll get into in the second half of this, um, it will just ask about your relationships and the funding footprint. So if you are not located there, but services are happening there, that's something we'd want to know about. If you have good partnerships there, um, there's a lot of ways to address this. Um, and again, I will dive into that a bit more in a minute. Um, so important um, to all of you is how do you kind of engage in this process? Um, and so in addition to changing the priorities or refining the priorities for EPHT, they also made some process changes that would align with the kind of mission and purpose they want to see carried out. So previously, they have granted in three different cycles, um, the first three quarters of the year. And so that will be reduced to a two quarter um, or two cycles per year so that it better aligns up with fiscal years for nonprofits and just um, there was always more funding available in quarter one versus by the end of quarter three and that just isn't really fair um, to the process so we're kind of starting with a blank slate and it'll move to that two um, cycles per year and then additionally it's previously been um, an open an open application process anyone who kind of feels like they're a good fit can can apply. And what we're doing now is moving to um, the first part of the process being a letter of interest. Um, and that is to uh, just ultimately save kind of the trustees um, some time and nonprofits some time um, and being able to give a, a faster overview of the project before being invited to fully apply. Um, and that was a really key part of what the trustees wanted is just more opportunity to engage deeply with applications that ended up coming through. Um, and then something our team and the trustees are really excited about is to be able to award some multi-year funding, um, which has never been the case before. And I'll, again, go into some more detail on that. Um, so the letter of interest is not exactly a letter. Um, it's essentially just a shortened um, form um, of required questions that will be on the St. Louis Community Foundation's grant portal. Um, and Nikki's going to go over kind of how to get set up on that. Um, at the end of this presentation, if you aren't already, but I'm sure some people here have already quite familiar with it. And that will be, um, that letter of interest will be open throughout the year, um, minus just the month of January, essentially, because we need to take a break from the old process and then implement this new process. Um, but essentially, it will be open as a rolling basis um, after this first cycle. Um, additionally, part of the letter of interest process is that you can have conversations with our staff after the deadline um, for each cycle, which I will show um, what that scheduling process will look like. And the, the letter of interest, the LOI, will determine um, who is invited to a full application. And that application will just build slightly on the letter of interest. Um, it's not the full common grant as it has been in the past. Um, and that will be, again, by invitation and um, more budget and financial documentation will be required at that stage. Essentially, we're going from the proposal to just more concrete details at that stage. Um, if you've applied with EPHT in the past, you will see that these questions um, are somewhat similar. And then there's also just new questions um, or reduced questions. And that's to reflect the trustees um, um, desire to center access and equity kind of in new ways. So 
um, a lot of questions are asking how are you addressing relevant barriers um, for the groups and of people that you want to impact and asking questions about how leadership identifies. And um, that's also for our team to be able to make sure that we um, can disaggregate data for um, our own kind of process improvements for this program and looking at just strengths and challenges that your organization faces in um, seeing equitable outcomes. Um, again, that relationship to the footprint is new um, for our process. So just giving us a sense of how you're interacting with people and organizations and those uh, 25 zip codes. And the most important thing, just kind of across the board for the LOI and the full application is just connecting the dots back to how is what you're proposing moving the needle on people having access to care. Um, this is when I will give a caveat because we are recording this and it will be posted. These dates are all accurate um, today. If, if anything, if you ever see a discrepancy between the website and this presentation, trust the website because that's what we will be constantly updating rather than this reporting. Um, but I just wanted to walk through again how that LOI, um, that LOI timeline works. So it will open um, on our grants portal on January 30th. Um, and then anyone who submits an LOI between January 30th and March, 30th and March 1st will be considered for that first grant cycle. Um, so, but I, like I said, it's gonna be open um, kind of throughout the year. So if you submit something on March 2nd, you will be able to submit, but you will not be considered until cycle two. So you won't hear back um, until the end of September, which is a big time lag. So just kind of keep an, keep an eye on when the, um, the cycle deadlines are. And then uh, moving forward from, you know, this first cycle on March 1st, um, our team will be available for conversations and, Again, I'll jump into that in a second, but that just means that there is an opportunity for you to kind of speak further or clarify things that um, you maybe felt like you couldn't capture in the LOI. And then um, this is important too, um, for any of any of you for who are here on organizations who re re received EPHT funding um, in 2022, we're really implementing a blank slate. So if you received something um, in quarter three, you can still apply for the first cycle of this year because we want people to be able to choose the cycle that actually is best for their organization. Um, and our team would be happy to kind of chat with you on what reporting um, would look like and kind of, you know, dotting all the I's crossing the T's um, on that last grant. Um, we also wanna be transparent about um, kind of realistically the size of grants. Um, at most awards will be one year and um, the $25,000 is the essentially ceiling for what annual funding would like. and then. With the new implementation of the multi-year um, possibility, thinking about that 25,000 cap is still relevant. It just means that if you applied for funding up to three years, your total request would be 75,000. Um, and the multi-year um, kind of proposals that would be most likely to be granted are having that broader impact, regional in impact, or are kind of doing Creative, um, creative work with co-location of services or other formalized collaborative partnerships, just recognizing that those are messy and just being able to have some additional time built into that award could make those projects more successful. Um, similarly, um, we recognize that hiring workers and supporting um, a key, a key um, care team member strategically um, could involve you know, multi-year commitment to someone so they know that they're, they can stay with the organization. So those are the pieces that we were really thinking about um, in moving to this multi-year opportunity. Um, so as I said, there is the opportunity once you have submitted the online letter of interest to schedule with our team for additional conversation. This is not the only grant program that we work with. Um, so our team doesn't have of unlimited time, unfortunately, to dive into this, but we did want to at least start. Um, it's, and it's a bit new for our process to have 20 minute conversations. Um, it's completely optional. I would rather write everything um, I communicate than speak it, but some people are the opposite. So we just wanted to be able to capture multiple ways of people um, speaking to their project and their organization's work. Um, so this scheduling um, tool will be posted on the website um, for EPHT as well. It's not up yet. And just the important thing to remember is that those conversations are after the, the deadline. Um, and they'll all be uh, virtual as well, just so we can accommodate as many as possible. 
And this kind of a screenshot of what it will look like. It's not Calendly, but it looks very similar if you've used that before. Um, and one thing that's tricky, and maybe I will crack the code before I put this up there, but it's not possible, as far as I can tell, to um, add other people from your organization to the call. So if that's really important to you to, you know, you want to talk with us and then have someone else um, from your team be part of that conversation, just include that in the notes um, when you um, when you book a conversation. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Nikki, who's just going to talk a little bit about um, what reporting could look like in this new process, and then she's going to um, do an overview of how to access and get set up on our grants portal as well. Some of you are very familiar, but just in case it's new for anyone. Thank you, Emily. Um, so there's always a lot of questions around EPHT reporting because it really was a floating um, date before, and um, I think there were a lot of questions about um, reporting and then applying for the next year. So first and foremost, we do want to say that if you had an award last year, we will be starting with a blank slate, as Emily said, this year. So feel free to apply in whichever cycle makes the most sense for your team and your programming. Um, we have not yet set those dates or finalized the reporting for, um, for this process. They will be set dates for cycle one and two. We it is possible we will have reporting done on a nine month basis instead of a 12 month basis, because what we have found is that we can learn so much from you at that juncture um, and still report back to the trustees um, without, without interrupting the cycle of your, your programming. Um, and also in, in terms of reporting, um, I always like to say our, our team, we are, we are all social workers. We have all done grant writing. We've all done grant reporting. So we empathize and sympathize um, with this process. And we always want our reporting to be informational and not something that feels like a burden to you. We will never ask for information that is completely off base or out of the ordinary. We really want to learn about what, what's happening on the ground, um, what you're experiencing, what, you're, what your constituents are experiencing, so that we can learn from you and so that our, our trustees can learn from you. It really is a, is a cycle of learning for us, and that's, that's the most important thing. Um, and I always say too about reporting, if there's something we're not asking, tell us. Um, we, we definitely want to know because um, there are definitely things that we don't think about in some cases and, and um, are brought to our attention by our funded partners. And we're always, always grateful for that. We will, um, we will get that information out as soon as we, we finalize everything. Um. The grant portal, it, I see a lot of familiar faces and names here today. So many of you are already registered in our grant portal, already have um, applied with us in the past. Um, if you have not, the link is included here. Um, you can go to, the, to this link now, even before the application is open and create a new account um, for your organization. We do recommend um, several things. One, um, that you have all of your information about your organization um, at the ready when you're doing the registration because um, you won't be able to save it and go back. You will have to do it all at once. It's not a ton of information. It's really basic address, website, EIN, um, your contact information. Um, we also ask um, that you register to contacts and that's really helpful for us in communicating with you. Um, we often use the system to send automatic, automated messages um, to big batches of, of applicants. Um, and it is helpful to have at least a, two, um, two contacts, one being the applicant contact and one being your chief um, executive officer or your organization's, um, the person in charge of that grant making process, grant writing process. Um, logging in, um, if you do have questions about logging in, creating an account, we do have, um, instructions available. You can download them. They are linked on the EPHT website. They will also be linked um, within the, um, the application if there's ever any questions. Also, I'm always available. I am sort of the resident um, person in charge of all, uh, all customer service as far as our online system goes, and we're always happy to, to offer any assistance. Um, our philosophy is if you're in our system and applying, we are responsible to get you across that finish line and we'll do everything we can to, to make that happen. Um, the other thing I do wanna point out that are, are, there often are a lot of questions about is collaborating within your team. That is an option in the system. There is a button that's located at the top of every form that says collaborate. And if you press that, 
You can invite anyone else that's a member of your team within the system to edit or submit that application on behalf of the, the primary applicant. The system will assign that primary applicant and that's the owner, but obviously other people are allowed to, to be part of that as well. went over things pretty quickly. Um, so we'll leave it open for questions, um, sort of general questions. If you have more specific questions about your um, your specific grant or what you might um, you might want to, to make a request for, let us know. We're always happy to have a conversation around that. I know that um, many of you have various programs that might be appropriate for this funding. And sometimes it's really about making the right choice and and um, and and refining that request with us a little bit more. Can you speak a little bit more to the special projects? Emily, do you want to talk a little bit more about what would be in that special projects category? And I'll take um, Carol's call. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's probably it's a great question because it is um, that's our more broad and kind of flexible column or priority area. Um, EPHD has always had that in past applications. Um, it looked some of the language looked a little different, um, but capital was included and capacity building. So it's it's kind of been a somewhat of a choose your own adventure box. But for what they are really looking for in that is if there is a, an ability to have kind of a regional impact um, or just something that didn't quite fit in the other categories um, because we can't always predict the kind of next public health or health crisis or opportunity. Um, so that would be, if you have something in mind, um, that that's something that our team could could talk um, with you about. I, I think that might be language on the website, just hey, reach out to us if you think you might have a special project. Um, yeah, so. I don't think that was probably very clarifying, but essentially we can have a conversation with you. And to um, answer, oh, go ahead. I'll answer Carol's question about submitting um, an LOI in the first and second cycle. We are asking organizations to um, apply once per year. That being said, our system does allow if you have submitted an LOI in that first cycle and you have a conversation with us and you're not quite ready or you wanna go back and, and make some changes before having the trustees consider that LOI, we are able to, to send that back to you so that you can resubmit um, in, the second, um, in the second quarter or second cycle. And then I do see um, a couple other questions in the chat. Um, also, if, if you'd rather just speak out your question, totally feel free to come off, come off mute. Um, there, there will not be that same consideration of um, a certain number of past funding years. This question is um, EPHT has um, kind of used a process where if someone was funded three years in RL, they have taken a break just because of the like sheer number of requests that were coming in. Um, so that would not affect um, the review of an LOI um, kind of moving forward into 2023. Um, the behavioral health priority, Sarah um, had a question. Um, that is remaining very similar to the funding um, that EPHD has done and EPHD has done, done in the past, but really it is focused more on access to behavioral health care, quality, um, mental health services, um, but very similar um, to, to how they were funding in the past. So I'm trying to keep track of all the all the questions. I don't know, do you want to answer the question about um, food programming um, and transition? Yeah, um, that's not like a, something that we've been in kind of back and forth with the trustees about for a while. So again, if there's that direct thread to um, how a nutrition programming would really support um, folks' care and management of their chronic disease, um, it's, it's worth um, putting into an application. The trustees didn't want to, um, I think the example that we had um, kind of their feedback is they didn't want to fund like a school lunch program um, they kind of wanted it to seem more directly part of someone's kind of care plan. Um, Hi, Emily, this is Carol. I'm the one who asked that question about the, the food. Would you fund cooking classes to teach people how to cook nutritiously? And then um, is that something to consider or not? Um, 
I think that might be something where we can just talk with you because it, it kind of depends like how it's fitting in with other activities that are going on and kind of what um what your pop like what your um I guess population is kind of doing around that as well. So that's something we can connect with you about if you want to. I don't think I put it up here, but grants at stlgives.org is like the easiest way to get in touch with us. Um, especially me because there's a lot of Emily's at our organization. Um, so yeah, we could um we can follow up with you just to see kind of get that fuller picture of of where that programming fits in. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. I'll I'll address Gina's question about um funding pro projects at larger organizations. Absolutely. EPHT recognizes that this work is being done um by some of the largest organizations in the community as well as um much smaller organizations. So there's no limit really to um, or priority given based on agency size. Yeah, it, it's more so just really being able to talk about what you're doing in that footprint. Um, and then one thing I will say from our team and the trustees, if you are part of a very large organization, um, really differentiating what your budget is for that specific program or department when you submit, um, if you were invited to, full, to do the full application and needed to submit financials, it makes it really tricky if we have, you know, an entire university's budget versus what that, you know, specific health piece and project is. Chase, I will, um, I will send you a personal message. We definitely, if you have specific questions you're new to EPHT about, you know, even framing that first um, ask, we're we're happy to talk to you more about that individually. Just mm -hmm. send us an email at grants at um, stlgives.org. And again, that is important because as Emily said, there's so many Emily's here. Sometimes it can get a little confusing. Um, we love it though. The triumvirate as I like to refer to them. Um, if you're approved in the second cycle, when will funds be received? Um, probably, so the cycles will be second and um, second quarter and fourth quarter. Um, so the funding will usually be our, we always aim to have that funding out in the same quarter within just a couple weeks of making the approval. We don't hold those funds here, so there are a couple extra steps in terms of getting those checks out and making sure that all of the powers that be on both the Episcopal and the Presbyterian side um, have have made um, made their their decision. So we um, it is a little bit of a delay. It usually takes a couple of weeks longer, but we plan to get them out right away. There are no specific chronic diseases that the trustees are prioritizing. Um, they are, are looking across the board that chronic diseases are um, most definitely something that people in the St. Louis region are experiencing across the board. Right, and I think um, obviously looking at something chronic, the kind of prevention or direct treatment, like the cost of that can just vary very widely. And so that's why we are transparent about the size of the award because that it, you know it might make sense for certain activities over others um, again. And the zip codes, oh, thank you. I should have uh, mentioned that. Everything that is in these slides is also on the EPHT website, including a map and a listing of the zip codes that you can download or just view in your browser. So you can always refer back to that. Um, and off the top of my head, I do not remember what the character limit is about um, kind of how much room you have to describe client demographics in your relationship to zip zip code, but those are two separate questions um, that you could certainly kind of share some similar information or be able to add in different ways. And Nikki, am I missing anything about that? No, the character limit's an issue. You know what? It's so funny. We joke, we kind of joke about this a lot. We struggle with the character limits um, because we don't want to make them too big because then, you know, as a grant writer, you just want to fill that space. Um, and we don't want you to feel like you have to fill that space um, if, if it's not necessary. But obviously we want to don't want to make it too small because we want to give you room. Um, that being said, we can always adjust those. Honestly, if if we we see like mid LOI, oh my gosh, this is not enough, I can go in in about 30 seconds and, and make that edit and give give everybody more space. Um, but if, yes, absolutely. We'll keep a close eye on those character limits because sometimes they do um, they do come back at us. Um, and I think uh, Yvonne had a question about 
um, kind of being a really highly collaborative organization, um, we would definitely welcome kind of a, you know, literally the proposal is saying, hey, we are applying as a, a collaborative partnership. And the questions would just ask to kind of outline who is responsible for what, what those roles are. Um, but generally, you know, if they're if they're two distinct projects and your organization is really closely involved with both of them, like maybe that would just be something our team could talk with you about on the front end. But again, we are aware some organizations are very large and have, you know, a wide range of programs under their umbrella that could be very distinct. So it wouldn't like, automatically be disqualifying. We just we'd be happy to kind of craft that with you um, ahead of time. And I know it might sound confusing that we have the LOI conversation piece as an option once the LOI is submitted. Um, but if you watch anything else from our team presentations we've done about the other grant making programs under the St. Louis Community Foundation, we do always welcome conversations because it just can be challenging to really kind of pare down what exactly is the best fit for you. So we can do some of that. It's just once the um, once you know what you're doing or what you're going to apply for, we aren't going to help you write the LOI. We can just talk to you about that after. So that's kind of the differentiation differentiating piece. <laughs> Yeah, and we have those conversations all the time. Um, you know, and specifically around EPHT, I will get like, what about this ask? And I'm like, I don't know if that's the best. What about this one? I don't know. And then, you know, third or fourth, it's like, yes, that's that's the one. That's the program. So we're always happy to have those conversations. Aya had a question oh. about applying for the Spirit of St. Louis Women's Fund. That's a really good question. Um, the community foundation manages several um competitive and responsive grant making programs. Um but they are all um, individual programs. So the Spirit of St. Louis Women's Fund um, is not related to EPHT, except for the fact that we, we manage that grant making um, for our online system. You are, you are free to apply for any of the open grant applications on our, um, on our online um, grants portal that you believe are a good fit for you. Um, there's no restrictions on applying to, to one and not the other. And actually, I will say the Spirit of St. Louis Women's Fund gets a, a, a massive number of applications every year. So, you know, a lot of a lot of repeat names and faces um, come through for sure. Um, and then there's a question about whether um, the trustees would look more fav favorably upon a new project idea. Um, I think especially if you know, if what you're um, looking at could possibly fit within that, the, some of those multi-year considerations. Um, you, there's no need to create something new with the EPHT trustees. I really just want to see that they're um, that you know you're moving the needle on access and providing quality care. They've never been people that need to see a certain number. They just are really looking at what the service is and if it makes sense for kind of the goals that they have and that your organization has. So um, you could certainly apply for the same thing. Um, if that's if that would be more of a priority for your organization. I mean, mostly they want to know what your needs are. I think that's the most important thing I really like to stress here is that, you know, as the, the way that we do funding and the way that we do grant making here at the Community Foundation, I think it's a real privilege for us to allow um, the nonprofits to, to express those needs in a very honest way and not try to tailor your request um, too much to to try to please someone um, or try to please a, a group of um, trustees. Um, you know, if it's within those priority areas and you believe that that work is moving that needle and you um, you know you think that it is your greatest need, we want to know. That. Yes, in the LOI, we will um, we will ask if you are interested in in multi year funding at that time. And I. I don't think it's in the questions that I've seen um, for this virtual session, but a, a question that was asked, I believe the last one was just if you if you you know sought out multi-year funding, if that basically meant you wouldn't be considered for a one year. Um, so if that could potentially be like a disadvantage, and we won't review it that way. If it you know if it's something where there's just not it's not prioritized as multi-year, but it's still something that the trustees would be interested in that one year. It, it might be something where I have to come back to you and say, you know, like, is it still viable or get some more information, but um, it'll be kind of fully considered, um, especially as that's new for the trustees to navigate um, in this process too. Okay, um, 
I'm Great trying question. to make sure I didn't miss a chat question. Did you see a new one? <laughs> I have not. Hopefully I, we have not missed anybody. And again, feel free to come off mute if you feel more comfortable that way. Thank you all. And honestly, we look forward to hearing about your feedback um, on this process because it's new to us, it's new to the trustees. And you know, like I like I said, we really we really value the learning that we um, do with our funded partners. It's really a partnership for us. Um, and we, we would not be able to do our work without the knowledge of what your work looks like. So thank you for that. Yeah, feel free to jump off at any time. Um, Nikki and I will hang out a little bit. Um, but yeah, thanks for taking time and we look forward to, you know, continuing to get to know you all and your work.